Well, welcome. Uh, I'm really excited about the conference for a little bit different reason in regards to uh, all the workshops, but learning from all of you. I find it, I was just saying out there over a cup of coffee, I think that it's wonderful to really find out what everybody's doing around the world. And you'll really see, uh, if you put on your networking hats, uh, there are people here today from all corners of the globe doing restorative practices. So uh, I'm always in awe of what all of you are doing. So when Ted asked me to help moderate or facilitate this discussion in a little bit different way, I was, I was interested because I think sometimes we all go to these different conferences and there's a keynote and it all kind of depends on how dynamic that keynote speaker is of how the first hour or two goes. Um, but what makes this a little bit different is, is that you all get to participate and we get to create the theme together in regards to restorative practices and what it looks from a criminal justice perspective. So I know several of you in the audience, uh, some of you are students in the grad school or have been working within the criminal justice field for many years from a restorative justice perspective can really add to this conversation. So I know it may be a little bit intimidating to come up in front of the room and speak at the microphone, but I'd like to encourage any of you to do that when we get there. So uh, I'm really hoping that this is gonna be a participatory type of event this morning, so. Um, we've uh, pulled together a great group of folks to start off the conversation today, and I wanna take a moment and introduce them a bit. Uh, Vidya Negria is here uh, at the end, and Vidya is, our, uh, is the director of IRP in Hungary, uh, and currently she's been working on restorative strateg strategies in prisons, uh, specifically FGDM, FGCs, um, from her, uh, I would say, clinical psychology type of uh, background. Uh, we also have Lisa Bettinger from the Community Justice Center, uh, the director of the South Burlington Center, um, and she's gonna talk to you a little bit about what's been happening in Vermont. Vermont's been a pretty progressive state uh, in regards to implementing restorative justice and restorative practices. Um, Fernanda Fonseca Rosenblatt, did I get that right? Yeah, I was pretty good, I've been practicing. Um, and uh, Fernanda, interesting, she's uh, originally from Brazil, but she's doing her dissertation at Oxford University, uh, and it's specific to the youth offender panels uh, in the UK. Uh, so she's gonna share a little bit about our research and what she's learned um, going through this process. So, and last but not least, uh, Mark Amadola. And Mark is the uh, CEO of Perseus House, um, which is an organization out in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, but is also the co founder of Education and Treatment Alternatives, which uh, I've started a relationship with in regards to aggression replacement training and as an allied restorative practice uh, implementing. Um, these type of skill-based activities for youth, at-risk youth, uh, that uh, programs that I work with uh, in regards to reducing anger and aggression and recidivism. So, okay. So, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the things that I've noticed in regards to the evolution of restorative practices from a criminal justice perspective. And specifically for me, it's from a juvenile justice perspective in Pennsylvania. I think that it's been for us, how do we adapt to change and where does restorative justice fit into the things that we're doing both in day treatment programs, foster care programs, outpatient programs in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, you could look to, uh, there's a brief article in the handbook, I think it's page 97, uh, that I kind of outline some of what we're gonna be discussing and specifically to what I'm gonna talk a little bit about. But, I've been with Community Service Foundation for about 17 years, started out as an addictions counselor, and uh, from that point, from the beginning, uh, when I've started to do that, Pennsylvania's framed their philosophy in BARGE, Balance and Restorative Justice, is what many of you have heard of in the past. And I think that to, to fast forward to now and what's been happening recently is, is the conversations have changed, and where Balance and Restorative Justice was more about how many community service hours you've done or how have you engaged uh, local community or what services do you have for victims, that it's become more about the restorative practices. So what are you doing to engage schools? What are you doing to engage the community? What are you doing in regards to 
evidence-based and effective services. What does that look like and how are you measuring that? So Ted talked a little bit about assessment in higher ed. I think that from our perspective in Pennsylvania, we've really looked at the assessment in regards to, so what works with kids and what's really effective? So I'm going to talk, in one of the breakout sessions that I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be talking about see Community Service Foundation's role and restorative justice within this focus, this assessment perspective in evidence. And I think that what it's pushed us to do is become very explicit about our practice. So what does that really look like? What does restorative look like within one of our programs? Uh, we were challenged with uh, a local community um, juvenile court uh, group, uh, county, got to us and said, we'd love a program that would be an alternative to placement. Kids were being sent to um, secure care, boot camps, things of that sort, for multiple violations. But they weren't necessarily creating harm in the community. So with that, that was a real great opportunity for us to be creative in creating a restorative element for kids. So one of the things that we did is, is that we created a restorative reporting center is what we, we call it. We kind of stole from the evening reporting center model and put restorative elements into that to really create uh, an environment where kids could come and every kid that walks in the door is offered a family group decision making conference kids are engaged with families, we have family nights every week. It's about connecting and trying to reduce recidivism from that perspective. So far we've been into it for about two and a half years. We're seeing that uh, recidivism is at, at about 20 percent. Uh, we have 70 percent success rate for kids that are coming out of the program that are remaining home that are not going to a secure placement. So these are really high-risk kids that are coming to us and we think we're really making uh, quite an impact. So. When you're thinking about what are the things that you can do and what are the restorative perspectives you can have, even within a system, I think that the conversations have changed for us over time. And again, I think for us internally, it's been about how do we make what we do really explicit for not only ourselves, our staff, but for the families and the kids that we serve. So uh, I'm going to go next to Vidya. Um, who's going to talk a little bit about her work in Hungary. If you push it on the bottom for a moment. A little bit longer. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Morning. It's a pleasure to be here again. And uh, Craig asked me to start by singing a Hungarian song. <laughs> but I won't, because it will take more than 10 minutes. <laughs> so I would like to talk about the adaptation and evolution of restorative practices in the Hungarian criminal justice system uh, based on the four questions, what are the main question of our conference, what works, what doesn't, how and why. And um, I can tell you in a few seconds what works, and I will tell you now, where restorative practices works. Um, what doesn't? It doesn't work when it's um, offered by people who doesn't have their own experience in restorative practices. Maybe they are trained, maybe they know the theory, but um, in my experience, and in Hungary, it doesn't work if you are not engaged in restorative processes through your journey of becoming a restorative practitioner. How it works and why it works, this is the longer part of my uh, speech now. Uh, I can, we can talk about the first two questions in a breakout session, but now, because of the time, I would like to um, talk about how and why. So for me, um, from my experience, and this started 12 years ago, in 2001 when I went back to Hungary after spending one year in CSF Bethlehem um, working by or learning by doing restorative practices, um, I went back to Hungary and I wanted to really uh, set up a school, a day treatment center 
uh, for trouble youths to see how restorative practices works. And since then, I'm trying on different fields. And what really works is um, engaging people with their family and their community to help them learn, grow, and make positive changes, even if they are in crisis or if they are facing serious conflicts or trauma. Then the other thing what works is allowing uh, the free expression of feelings and thoughts in a safe place. And the other one what really works uh, and make different make a change in the uh, people who get in touch with restor restorative practices is the trust uh, that people are competent to make uh, changes and to have a say uh, and interact in way in way which uh, maximize their positive um, behavior. These three things, I think, uh, for, from what I saw in Hungary, are the main um, foundation of restorative practices. It's very short time to, say, to talk about this, but it took me 12 years <laughs> to really implement it in different fields. I started in 2003 by setting up a, an experiment model for um, trouble youths, and it worked. Then in 2007, um, we had IIRP conference in Budapest, which was a great experience, and it worked and supported the implementation of restorative practices because it was for the first time when after each presentation or film or video what we saw about restorative practices, pre people from different parts of the world and Hungary and the people from um, the policy maker system and practitioners were sitting in a circle of 10 and having something, a talking piece going around. And it was for the first time, for example, when a head from the Ministry of Justice was listening to a social worker who is working on the uh, field, and they all have this experience of sitting in a circle. That was, for, from my perspective, the biggest support what restorative uh, practices can offer to people to start to be engaged in, in understanding and have a, a shared understanding of what is uh, restorative practices. And that, is what, well, that was the moment when uh, probation officers and staff from the prison started to think about how can they implement this good feeling what they have <laughs> in the circles in their, in their work. So, uh, in 2008, the probation uh, system decided to take some of uh, restorative principle, explicitly family group decision making and restorative circles to involve families to develop a plan for the young offenders. So instead of having professionals developing the plan for the people, we start to involve family um, in the probation system. That worked perfectly. It was less stress for the professionals and more joy for the family. Uh, then, in 2009, one of the governor, governor of the prison in north of Hungary, where the situation is quite bad, the prison is overcrowded, there are a lot of conflicts, there are su suicidal uh, events within the prison. Um, he, this governor, because he experienced uh, what is the atmosphere or, of a restorative circle in all the work what we did around the prisoners or, or around the probation system, he said that he would like to feel okay when somebody is released from the prison. But he doesn't know uh, what to do because if he asks probation officers to write the report or police to write the report to see how is going the, this environment when the, where the prisoners go back to have the men or women included again in society, what he sees from the report is something what doesn't satisfy his needs because he doesn't know if there are going to be no more conflicts, he doesn't know if the person will be received well. It, he, he doesn't know what needs to happen to, to reduce recidivism. 
So we came up with the idea to have a restorative circle with those who are going to have back this person. We involved community, family member, of course, um, um, and everybody who knew that uh, this man or woman is going to be back. And we were sitting in a circle with the governor or the of the prison, with the staff from the prison, with the family, with the community member, discussing what needs to happen to have these people back in the community and develop a, a plan uh, for him to, to, for the transition back into the society. And we figured out that it's the perfect time to uh, set up an fam a family group decision making or a family group conference for these purposes. So we started with circles where people were uh, allowed to express their feelings and it was very important for the family to listen to the feelings of the governor <laughs> who said that I'm scared of letting this person home after uh, 15 years of imprisonment because he committed a crime. So what can we do to support each other and to support this person and also what, what can we do to support the victim's family who are still there in that community. So this is how we start. And uh, now I can say that um, uh, all this staff who uh, became familiar because of their needs, their, they speak up their needs, so um, they became familiar with restorative practices, they started to promote restorative practices, not just FGDM, but restorative circles and conferencing as well, to promote everywhere in the system. And as a result, the criminal code is changed now. And I'm not sure how it's going to be implemented, but in criminal code, in the Hungarian criminal code, it says that restorative processes can be uh, implemented in dealing before, during, and after sentences with all kinds of conflicts. Um, what doesn't work? <laughs> When people, they think that they know what it is and they do it. And I can say, I, I saw having a group of people of 20, uh, all talking about how to support the offender to be again a member of the society. And there is one victim by himself looking at this show, which wasn't his at all. So there are going to be a lot of mistakes and there are going to be a lot of difficulties, but I think it's better than not doing anything else. So even if it, it goes wrong, within a few years, pro I'm sure that we are going to do what is right for everybody. Thanks, Vidya. Uh, next we have Lisa. So I'm the director of the South Burlington Community Justice Center in South Burlington, Vermont. And what I'm going to try to talk about is that Vermont has in many ways institutionalized and folded um, restorative practices into the criminal justice systems and to give you a picture of what that looks like. Um, and this Um, so, and this is both with adults and juveniles, and so there are three primary uh, places within the criminal justice system where restorative practices happen. One is within court diversion programs. Those are funded through the state's attorney general's office, and they're mostly organized on a county-wide basis. There's also balanced and restorative justice of barge programs, which in Vermont is particularly um, organized around juvenile probation in conjunction with our Department of Children and Families. And then there's uh, community justice centers. Those are funded through our Department of Corrections, and they're primarily community-based. Um, there are 20 community justice centers throughout Vermont, the oldest about 12 years old, and the newest ones just this year. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about the community justice centers because that's what I know more about. Um, they, some of them are nonprofits. Um, some of them are based part of larger organizations. Most, many are municipally based, and that could be either a standalone office or part of the municipal offices. There's three of us um, that are based right within the police departments. So, 
Now I'd want to give you a range of, here's the range of restorative practices that the community justice centers do. Um, they're different because the community justice centers are intentionally community-based, so that what happens is tailored to that community. So by nature, they're different, um, community to community. So the first three are related. They're restorative processes either before or after sentencing. Um, so the, um, direct referrals um, cases come to the community justice centers instead of going to court. Um, this could be directly from the police department referrals um, or it can be from the state's attorney's offices. And the processes that we use, we have discretion over what process is the right process to use um, for each case. So often it's reparative boards, sometimes restorative conferences, sometimes family group conferences. And then a certain percentage of, of the cases are also restorative processes where they've been to court and the judge has said as part of your, um, your conditions of probation, you need to do a restorative process. And so some of the cases are um, to fulfill their um, conditions of probation to work with us. And we also have fairly new legislation in place where the court can send someone to come work with us without them being on probation as well. So it's instead of probation. Um, we work with both the affected parties when they want to be involved and the offenders um, in those three different types of cases. And just to give you an example, South Burlington's population is around 18,000 people. Um, in those three categories I just described, we worked with um, 240 cases last year. About 80% of those were instead of court, so direct referral, and about 20% of them as um, part of their probation. We refer to that as reparative probation. Um, just to give you kind of the details about how this works, we have two staff people in South Burlington, one 19 hours, myself 32 hours, and 20 volunteers and um, worked with that many people. The range of employees at the community justice centers is anywhere from one part-time person to up to 10 employees. Um, mostly two, three, four is probably the normal. Um, so other types of restorative practices that the community justice centers do um, are offender reentry, and that is working with um, moderate and high-risk offenders who are being released from jail back to our communities anyway. Um, and they're, they're still under the um, supervision of the Department of Corrections when we work with them. And the goal of that is that there's no new victims in our communities and to help people make that difficult transition out of jail back to the communities and to do that successfully without reoffending and to actually have good lives. Um, the main, one of the main processes we use with um, offenders is circles of support and accountability where three community members um, volunteer to work with that offender weekly for a year um, get to, and support all, both support and um, make sure that when they're starting to do risky behavior that might lead them to reoffend to catch that very early and to help them not go down that path. Also as part of offender reentry, some of the community justice centers also operate transitional housing so that people actually have a place to live as a way to support offenders as well. Another area of restorative practice is that some community justice centers is parallel justice programs, which are completely um, victim-centered programs where it doesn't matter what's, where the offender is in the criminal justice system and the victim is served anyway. Um, so it's really about what do victims of crime need and we don't care if your offender's actually even ever caught and to serve victims. Um, let's see, also many of the community justice, justice centers uh, coordinate and support their local schools to implement restorative practices within our local schools. And um, that could be anywhere from elementary to college. Um, and some of you know some of the work that the University of Vermont has been doing to integrate restorative practices into the resident system there. So big range of what's happening in schools. Another area is um, we all provide mediation and conflict assistance. Um, so when something doesn't rise to the level of the crime, to give people assistance to work through it so it doesn't. Um, and for example, in, at South Burlington, we had about 10 cases of, that were conflict assistance cases, and those actually take more time and more work than um, some of the other cases. 
And the last area is we do community and neighborhood forums, conversations, and trainings. So one example of that, there was a neighborhood in South Burlington where there's actually been two shootings in six weeks, which in Vermont is really unusual. And so people were very nervous and wanted to know how they could um, make their community safer. And so the police department, myself, and the the housing organization that owned the housing got together to have a neighborhood conversation about what, how can we work together so that this doesn't happen again and had a conversation about that. So I guess the last thing I want to say is I've had experience both working at a community justice center that was community based or a municipal but not just standalone in terms of location and now I work in one that's based in a police department and I didn't think there would be so many benefits of being co-located with the police department, but one of them is the rapport and the trust of being in-house with the police officers, and part of that is why that they refer cases to us, because they've been in the room, they've seen the process, they've been part of the process, and they, they actually get that we're not just sending them away, that something real is happening and they value it. So I, um, and also our police chief teaches classes in restorative justice in a local community college. So he, he's incredibly supportive. <laughs> so that makes a big difference as well. So you're welcome to come up to me throughout the conference if you'd like to talk about any of this. Great, thank you. Okay, next we have Fernanda. So hello, um, first lesson on how to make a Brazilian nervous, ask him or her to be concise. We're, we're not trained to be concise. We're trained to use four words when only one is necessary. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be concise. I'm very happy to be here, good morning uh, to all of you. And as Craig said, I'm gonna be sharing with you um, um, the experience, well, some snapshots of my perceptions of youth offender panels in England and Wales. Uh, we're talking here about what works, what doesn't work. I'm afraid it's gonna be more a step-by-step -step guidance on how not to make it not work, um, based on the Welsh and, and English experience. Um, which, well, the youth offender panels, I, I prefer to describe them as uh, theater productions rather than restorative practices. Um, the British are really good in that. <laughs> Um, but, but, but I think it's a very uh, uh, important uh, case study because um, as all of us uh, try to mainstream restorative practices into a system like the criminal justice system, um, we're going to uh, fa be faced with many of the challenges that the, um, they have faced there in England and Wales, so it is a, a, a case worth studying. Um, just to give a little bit of a background information uh, for those of you who are not very sure what the youth offender panels are and where they sit. So if we go back to 1999, that was when um, uh, a new legislation was introduced in England and Wales, uh, creating the referral orders as a primary sentin dis sentencing disposal for uh, sev uh, 10 to 17 year olds pleading guilty and convicted for the first time. Um, today, after uh, a couple of legislative changes, uh, a young person can get a referral order, um, or multiple referral orders, so that means that today um, he or she has to plead guilty, but um, they may have a, a previous conviction. But what is a referral order? Well, a referral order involves um, referring the young person to a youth offender panel. So the court in the sentence um, will specify the period uh, of time that the referral order will take, which can't be less than three months, nor more than 12 months, depending on the seriousness of the offense. Um, and then it's up to this youth offender panel uh, to uh, work out with the young person in a restorative meeting, um, a contract uh, where uh, it is decided what this young person will have to do to repair the harm and in which activities this young person will have to engage in uh, to prevent uh, a further offending. So the youth offender panel, um, in turn, is a panel comprised of at least two members of the community. And, and, and this is where um, the English and Welsh system try to make a huge step. I'm sure many of us here, um, when implementing restorative uh, practices um, in the criminal justice system, 
have been faced with the question of who am I going to involve as the community? So in that triangle of a victim, offender, and community, who am I going to involve in community? Especially if you go uh, further uh, uh, ahead than community of care. So who else, apart from the community of care, shall I involve in the process, and how do I choose that, and how? Well, in England and Wales, they chose um, to involve in the process two members of the general public, so two volunteers that are recruited, selected, and trained by the youth justice system, specifically by a unit within the youth justice system there called youth offending teams. So the judge sentenced their young person for a referral order. This young person goes to the youth offending team, and there a youth offender panel is set with two volunteers, which are recruited and selected and trained by the yacht or, or its partners, and uh, one yacht member, so one youth worker, the young person, the family, hopefully the victim. I've never seen one, but they say that sometimes there is a victim. Well, that's the idea, the theoretical idea behind it, and the victim supporters. Uh, a different thing about it is that the facilitator in the meeting is not the yacht worker, it's not the youth worker, it's not the professional. It's going to be the volunteers. So these volunteers are going to lead the meeting and facilitate the meeting. So there's this initial panel meeting where they all sit together and they should come up with a contract. Um, all these stakeholders. What, in theory, if you read all the legislation and national standards and the guidance that have been published since, yeah, over 10 years ago, um, they place and have always placed emphasis on, on uh, some restorative justice inspired values and principles. So community involvement is very present in all these documents. Uh, victim participation, dialogue, inclusiveness, empowerment, all these words are there. In theory, um, it is supposed to work as a restorative practice. In practice, however, um, I saw very little evidence of that happening. Um, as I said in the beginning, they are better described as theatrical production. So you have the producers of this play, which are the, the yacht workers. So they write a thorough report about the young offender, about the offense, and include specific recommendations on what should go into the contract. This script is then passed on to the actors, which are the community panel members, those volunteers that are going to lead the meeting. So they rehearse the play in a pre-panel meeting uh, where they read the report and the recommendation um, and then they're ready to get started. So the spectators, which is usually the young offender and his mom, comes in the theater, I mean the yacht premises usually, um, and the play starts. Um, so surprisingly, um, whoever is observing the panel knows exactly what's going to happen because it's all there in the report. The young person also reads the report and the parent as well. So um, it's a kind of a strange play because everyone knows how it's going to end and, and, and go <laughs> through. Um, at the end, then the contract is agreed and signed by everyone. Surprisingly, I have analyzed more than 50 contracts and uh, with the respective report and it's like a copy and paste. Um, sometimes it's already ready, they just have to sign it. Um, and I've been told that if they want to scrap something out, they can, but they never do. Well, I haven't seen that. But anyway, and then, um, and that's uh, the restorative uh, uh, meeting. Um, surely this is a, a very bad example of a restorative practice, but it, w what I find interesting is that when trying to mainstream uh, uh, or, or, or trying to implement restorative practice into the heart of the youth justice system, the criminal justice system, this danger of falling into theatrical projection, uh, productions is a real danger. Of course, there are many other uh, um, uh, question marks and, and many other issues that I would like to raise here and I won't have time, but I would just like to throw in some other topics related to this that I'm talking uh, so that uh, hopefully we can discuss later on or, or, or you know, during lunch or, or over a couple of beers later on. Um, anyway, what is the value of lay involvement in restorative practices? We have to ask this question. Um, some believe that it, um, it's good to involve uh, lay members of the public as the representatives of the, the victimized community. 
because because they are lay, they comes from they come from all walks of life, and they're going to be bring a fresh uh, uh, um, attitude and new ideas into the restorative process. Um, and when I say that, I remember a yacht worker that I've interviewed, and he was pretty skeptical about this uh, bringing lay people in. And I'm I, I, I'm sorry for for the quite unpolite quote here, but he said to me. One of my young people who was being done for assault was asked by the community panel members to tidy his bed every day as part of his contract. That's like reminding someone to wipe their ass. They shouldn't do that anyway. So what is the value of involving a, a lay? Some other people say, look, let's involve lay members of the public because uh, they have better local knowledge. Really? Do, do we know what's happening down the road where we live? I mean, do we know our neighbors in this postmodern liquid modernity? Um, well, my experience in England and Wales uh, with youth offender teams and, and, and youth offender panels is that the, actually the professionals had more local, local knowledge than the, the, the community members. And if not, for no other reason, because they ought to, because that's their work. Um, I remember being sitting there in a training uh, of some panel members um, and the yacht worker was listing the options of constructive leisure in that borough in London and I remember one panel member to be, one trainee, commenting out loud, are you serious? There's a youth centre on this street? That's the street I live on. How come I've never noticed? Um, another question, I'm almost done, I swear. Um, <laughs> What are the implications of involving volunteers in the process? Um, this speaks to questions such as, why do people volunteer? If it's to get a tick on their CV, is that detrimental to the restorative, restorative process? How? Or how can we make it less detrimental or, or useful in, in any way? Um, how is the recruiting process? Um, 12 years ago, when all th this all started in England and Wales, they were very worried, are we going to get enough people to volunteer? Today they have a, a waiting list um, of, of people wanting to do this, and they're celebrating, you know, we just need word of, uh, word of mouth. I mean, we, we have a waiting list. But whose mouth? Um, white, middle class, uh, retired woman. That's the picture I have of a community panel member in England and Wales. Um, what, and, and, and carrying on, I, I, during my fieldwork, I've interviewed three different groups of people. The young offenders, the community panel members, so the volunteers, and the yacht workers. The adults that I interviewed, so community panel members and yacht workers, um, were well, had this strong belief that the fact that the panel members or the community panel members were volunteers, that had a big impact on the young person. Because the young person would be sitting there and thinking, wow, you know, this person is not being paid to be here. This person is here to help me and, you know, not getting like, anything out of it. And then I interview the young people and, and I ask, so what, what did you think about the community members? And they go like, what do I mean? You mean the, girl, the, the look, granny looking woman? Yeah, and usually they say, well, these panel people are nice, but they, and, and one of my questions was, if they weren't there, would the meeting have been different? No, not really. Panel people say the same things as Ben, John, whoever the yacht worker was. So I'm not really sure if that has a huge impact as we adults think it has. And, um, to finish, uh, with professionals, so when you involve uh, 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 professionals in, in, in anything we do, um, with all these uh, equal opportunity laws, um, this helps us in some way to reach uh, some sort of diverse pool of employees. Um, it's not the same with volunteers. Um, on the other hand, with, a restor with restorative practices, we could think of a, a different concept of diversity. Maybe we should be involved in ex-offenders, and it doesn't matter if it's white, black, old, retired, or new. Um, maybe, maybe this would link better with the young offenders. I don't know. Um, anyway, to, I'll leave it here. Um, and just saying that I'm not this you know, bloody Brazilian coming to say that England and Wales is doing everything wrong. They, they gave a huge step. Um, we have now 
uh, thousands of people working in the youth justice system in England and Wales that use the words harm, victim, restorative justice, restore. And so something has changed. Um, but I would uh, uh, um, leave as a final message. We, we have to be careful not to get trapped in this theatrical production uh, 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 um, real danger. Thank you very much. So look for Fernanda's dissertation that's going to be published in the next year or so? In the next year or so. 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 Mark Amadola. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Craig had mentioned in his opening remarks that I'm the co-founder of Education and Treatment Alternatives. And that's true. And the other co-founder is sitting right over there, Bob Oliver. And Bob and I have worked together I'm almost afraid to say it, um, uh, probably collectively over 70 years of, of practice. Um, we have primarily spent our adult professional life working with kids and families and aggression and trying to help them really understand that it's self-destructive, um, actually can, can be fatal, lead to death, and have found a model uh, that's called aggression replacement training in its full form that came out in 1987. Bob and I were fortunate to meet Dr. Arnie Goldstein from Syracuse University in 1989. That began our journey. About four years ago, we met Craig in um, CSF through a grant through the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And we actually went through our full business model. Our business model takes two, two years to go through. Later on today, we'll give you an overview of that. I will not talk about that. Um, and Craig's staff did a great job, did an absolutely great job. And we were somewhat of taskmasters. There, it is an evidence-based practice through the Office of General Justice and Delin Delinquency Prevention and the um, uh, Department of Corrections. And, but we do that with a, with a very specific intent, that we want to make sure that everyone is delivering this highly quality model adherent program. And we know from Mark Lipsy's research at Vanderbilt that if it is not delivered with fidelity, that actually we can do harm. And do harm meaning that kids get worse. You know, that kids can get worse if you're not following the protocols as designed. We did not design the, the protocols, however, Goldstein gave us permission to modify them as we go along. Um, we, to take, I am, Craig mentioned that, and, and, and again, Craig continues to provide ART not only in the pilot sites, but across the board at CFS Bucksmont, correct? Um, at Perseus House, you also mentioned the CEO of Perseus House, and, and we have been engaging in um, restorative practices for a while. And, and just to give you a sense, um, every, we have 90 residential beds, every unit wakes up in the morning and we have a circle. And in that circle, the kids have to ask the questions, how are you feeling, what's your goal for the day, and who's going to help you with that goal. When they come back from school, that circle circles back up and they get back to the facility. Did they meet their goal? How are they feeling? Did somebody help? Did the person who they asked help them? And the same thing in the evening. And of course, we all understand, as we understand restorative practice, that that's a continuum. And that's just one form of that. Um, and I think that if we think of how um, aggression over the course of time has um, occurred, uh, it's impressive that there's so many um, countries represented here um, our friends in Sweden and Norway and even in England would say that um, they're catching up. They're probably five to ten years. These, this group right here is from England, is mostly from England and Wales. The, that, um, that they would say they're probably about ten years behind, but they're still seeing the same kinds of aggressive acts. And aggressive acts with no remorse, nor empathy. And so in order to do that, what do we need to do? Well, we need to teach empathy. Empathy that we hope would be taught at home. Empathy that we hope that a parent would nurture at a very, very early age and help a child understand why it's important to, under, to look at the point of view of somebody else, critical, absolutely critical. critical. Now, we, we, and this is not as, as a, we're a large group of professionals here, okay, um, uh, still in 2013 and all these change models that we have and all of the things that we talk about in terms of how to engage kids and families Adults still counteraggress with kids. Adults still do and say things to kids that they should not do. So we have to work with that. 
restorative practices does a great job of taking a look at how are you going to talk to kids, how are you going to engage those resources, those relationships, and how are you going to forge and deepen those relationships so that kid understands that, yes, now I am accountable to somebody, and then fully push that out into the community. In, in, in Pennsylvania, probation departments are finally figuring it out. Probation departments who typically do what? They put an electronic monitoring on a kid, a kid wears a bracelet, yeah, that kid might stay in that square for how long? Uh, not very long. Um, they, they have this list of uh, conditional uh, rules that kids have to follow. We have a parent group that, uh, uh, um, they're all ordered, they're all ordered to the parent group. The parent goes to see the judge, and the judge says, why are you not attending parent group? And the parent says, oh, it's my bowling night. Just as a matter of fact, okay? The judge says, you know what? If you don't go to the parent group, I'm going to hold you in contempt. Now, that judge is really going to hold that parent in contempt with two little siblings at home. I don't know that. I know that it was enough to make the parent continue to, go, to start to go to parent group. So, so probation is starting to look at this a little differently. We are training probation departments, as Craig is training probation departments in restorative practices, in becoming practitioners in aggression replacement training. So it's not just a matter of reporting back to judges how they're behaving, send a report to the judge, and away we go. Now probation officers are having to deliver the intervention and deliver it in a way that is delivered with fidelity. So that becomes critical. And as we think of just um, the, the way that restorative practices are delivered, we th if we think of, Ted and I were talking last night about it really is an organizational structure, an organizational framework. And for some organizations, it's an organizational change model. Because for some organizations, it really is getting staff to talk to kids in a way that is not only engaging, but does help forge these relationships. And um, Lipsy and Wilson really help us understand that, that those kinds of interventions have to be therapeutic, they have to be cognitive, they have to be behavioral, we, we, in ART, we talk a lot about the cognitive piece and how do we change cognitions. And by the way, we can change cognitions, but there's very specific research that talk to us about neuroplasticity and how do we do that. So the exciting part for me is that with this group of professionals and restorative practices, that we can share multimodal experiences. And we can put those experiences together to make better interventions for kids to do what? to be healthy citizens and to be healthy adults as they go through this whole journey. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and just a, a quick plug here for Mark and Bob. Through this relationship with us at Community Service Foundation and then with IIRP, uh, Mark uh, Amadola and Bob Oliver just became uh, lectures uh, faculty at the IRP and we're hoping to develop an ART graduate course in conjunction with the two-day professional development event so as the when we talk about evolution and you know as things come about we're seeing these allied restorative practices and offering them both as a practice level but also at a higher ed level so okay now we're gonna go to our experiment of having a participatory keynote presentation. So um, so who's going to be the first to volunteer and come up and... Come on, we need a sucker. I mean... Yeah. Uh, come on up. But seriously, anybody yeah. who's working in criminal justice and doing things with as opposed to two or four, we'd like to hear what is working for you or what is not, how and why. Anyone? Want to come up to the mic? Thank you. And, and we can just do a little line here so... People can come up while someone's speaking, and let's see how this goes. I didn't touch it. No. <laughs> um, my name's Val Keach, and I'm from the United Kingdom. You probably know by the accent. Um, I want to address my remarks to Fernanda. Uh, what you said was music to my ears. I can't wait to see your dissertation, because those of us working in restorative practice in the community have long said that what's happening with the youth referral practice, the youth referral panels, 
is, in my opinion, not really restorative practice or restorative justice. Um, you talked about the volunteers that they recruit. I would term them wannabe magistrates. <laughs> having met quite a few of them and having done battle with quite a few of them, they're people who either didn't get accepted as magistrates or couldn't quite go that far. I think one of the worries I have about the youth referral panels, having run a community justice programme for eight years, where we use only volunteers with paid staff, is the lack of contact prior to the referral panel from the volunteers. Um, you may all find that strange. I think we all find it very worrying and very strange. I think what I would say to Fernanda is it's the process that's wrong, it's not the using of the volunteers. It's how they're used in the youth referral panels in the United Kingdom. They go along, they're trained, they go along, but the youth offending team workers have done the work. So when your lad says, I don't know, the grey-haired old lady, you know, in the corner, it's because they have no relationship with them. With the project that we've just run for eight years, the relationship was built with the volunteers, the offender and the victim. Um, I've had meetings with our local yacht down in Avon and Somerset because they don't understand why we had something like a 90% turnout of victims attending and they had virtually none and it's because of that relationship. Um, I don't want to say much more except thank you and thank you for the work you're doing because hopefully it will change how the youth offender panels are run in Great Britain. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what is your name again? Sorry, Val Keach. Val Keach, thank you very much. Just two things about that. Um, I interviewed a, a yacht worker that was quite critical about the process, um, some of the few that were openly critical about the process, and she said something that I, I, think, I think summarizes what you've just shared with us. Drop the process and keep the volunteers. That, that, was, her, that was her final uh, uh, thing. A, a, another thing to add with what you just said, um, and I didn't have time to share with you, the contact between the young person and the community panel members is indeed very, very quick and, and, and um, so much so that they meet the, uh, the, the community panel members for the first time at the initial panel meeting and then they're supposed to have review meetings every three months. So let's imagine a 12-month referral order where there should be at least four panel meetings. Because of managerial and, and uh, organizational problems, or because the process is ill-conceived indeed, every time the young person goes to a review panel, it is um, more often than not the case that there is a completely different panel with completely different panel members. So indeed, they have almost no contact. It's that person that I've never seen in my life for 5, 10, 15, or if it's an initial <coughs> panel meeting, maximum one hour meeting, and then I never see that person again. So indeed, um, I totally uh, agree with what you just said. Thank you very much. Len? Hi. Uh, Len Raymond. I work in New London, Connecticut. Uh, I'm a case manager for the F FUSE program. It's a statewide program in Connecticut in five cities serving people who are frequently incarcerated and frequently homeless. And people often call it the, uh, the most difficult cases. And I'd like to uh, talk about aggression. I'm, when I work with them, I uh, work to remap the concept aggression. You know, there was a day when uh, aggression, aggression uh, was a good story. You go out and hunt for the animals and you kill an animal and you bring it home and you have something good to eat and you survive for another week or so. And now we've come up with another word for it that's often used, elan vital, that life force, that will to live, that you know, energy to push through boundaries. But that's a French word, that's not an English word. The uh, English word is aggression. And when we use the word aggression now, I find the concept that's being addressed is abuse. 
that abuse occurs and it's hard to say to someone you're being abusive. It's just like a little too corrosive, a little too much in their face. So I find we use the word aggression to hide abuse or to hide having to look at what we're really seeing is something very painful, which is abuse. And aggression is really in our world in a positive sense. Uh, people use the term aggressive marketing all the time in Wall Street. And, uh, you know, that guy, you know, is a real ag aggressive executive. He'll get up and, he's got get up and go, we'll do things. So the guys I work, that I serve, I tell them that, and, this population, uh, heavily incarcerated uh, history, their life force is alive and well. They're really aggressive. And I tell them that uh, this FUSE program is about going forward with that life force. You know, going sideways doesn't work, and we can talk about the things that don't work in going sideways, but going forward is, is what you've got to do. And I can feel it in all of them. They don't tell me it, I don't talk about it with them, but I feel in all of them that they have this thing in front of them, this barrier to go forward. They lack courage maybe, or they don't feel they have the strength, or they have all this anxiety because of trauma and they don't have the peace. So they see going forward and they see that they're not going forward. So I like to celebrate that aggressive spirit in them like to remap it because actually they are labeled as aggressive and they're labeled as a problem because you're aggressive. And I like to remap that into your life force is alive and well. You just need to go forward. And you may not have the, you may not be smart enough to find the courage in you. You may not be smart enough to find the strength in you. You may, may not be smart enough to find the peace in you. But those things are in you. And just by yourself, you can probably survive, because they all do, they've been on the street. But if you connect to others, if you step into the life of community, there are other people who will give you smarts. There are other people who will show where you have courage, will show where you have strength. And uh, I kind of rest with something that's kind of a classic thing. You, probably would all know the answer to this. Uh, what is the smartest thing in this room? It's, it's not Greg, it's not me on this subject. It's uh, obviously the whole room. The community is the smartest thing in the room. The expert may be the smartest person in the room, but the community is the smartest thing. And I say this with them also, that you know I'm telling you these things and they're making you smarter, but I'm just one person. You connect to other people, you'll get smarter still. And uh, we've got a little community going. Thanks. That's man. it. I, I have a question for Lisa. Did you inherit the champion police chief that you have to support you? <laughs> or did you influence that person and regardless of which way it works out, do you have any insights for the rest of us about how to cultivate a police chief that's a champion? Um, I did inherit him. Um, he was there before the Community Justice Center existed and was a partner with me to actually create and, and develop and start the Community Justice Center in South Burlington. Um, he had previous experience with restorative justice in his prior community in Barrie. And so he, um, and he was a, a youth and school resource officer earlier in his career. So he had experienced it on the job as an officer early in his career and, uh, and how to cultivate um, officers. I think actually one of the things I'd like to do, and I've been in conversation with the chief, is when they're doing their field training, is one piece of that field training is to come um, be with us on a case so that very early in officers careers they're exposed to restorative justice and restorative practices and it just becomes a matter of course that this is an option. So good morning my, my name is Terry O'Connell. I actually want to uh, pick up on a couple of themes and 
It's really to do with the difference between engagement and involvement. I listened to Fernanda and in 1994 I was fortunate to be on a church or fellowship and I sat in on a, a panel in, in London and I wrote an eight page uh, description of it and I described it as theatre. <laughs> I could not believe what I saw happening. And in fact, what it said to me, and I guess when I think about my involvement in Canberra, when the first really significant research was undertaken, and they were looking at uh, drink driving, and they wanted to work out who should be involved, and they came to me and said, well, what do you think? I said, the notion of a community member, we need to be really clear about role, where they fit, but fundamentally, I'm opposed to it on the basis that uh, the tendency would be to moralise and to, to bring a view that really won't resonate with the offender. And my concern was to drop them in without a really clear understanding of role, etc., would mean that they would be likely to involve the offender but not engage them. Um, Notwithstanding my protestations, uh, they went ahead with it and I got an email from Professor John Braithwaite who, when released, they released the research, it showed a much higher incidence of reoffending in those conferences where there was a community member. I raised the issue about engagement and involvement. When we tend to systemise processes, they become part of a routine. The problem is we lose the ritual. So what is a, what, what's the difference? The difference is that a ritual is a routine with a soul. And fundamentally, here's the difficulty. Whatever we're doing and trying to become restorative, if we, if we aren't engaged, and that was fitting what Vidi was talking about, and that is to be really effective as a practitioner, um, it has to be part of who we are. The second thing we need to do is be, and Craig alluded to this, the point of being explicit, understanding what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. And unless we as a group of practitioners share the same vision and understanding Unless we're explicit about that, it's really hard to engage others. And I guess the question that came up for me was to what extent, uh, and it builds on what Rob asked, Elisa and Vidya, to what extent does the modelling and the experience start to influence the thinking and the conversation you end up having in those institutions? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Marjolein Roovers. I'm a criminologist from the Netherlands. Um, I'd like to give a statement about the use of volunteers. Now, the um, use of volunteers in the Netherlands is quite different from the use of volunteers in the Anglo-Saxon countries. I don't know about Hungary, whether you use volunteers a lot, but I know in the Netherlands it's not very uh, widely used. A very simple example of restoring um, community patterns is using retired teachers coming into the prisons and teach the kids. Now the kids feel really happy because there's someone from the outside who takes an interest in me and teaches me on top of it something very valuable. The teacher comes in and feels, oh, I'm not that old anyway, I can still use my skills. The teacher goes out into the community and tells his neighbors and his friends, gee, you know, these guys are not so bad after all. Um, we've been finding that it was very, very uh, profitable for everyone. So this is a small example of how volunteers, I think, can be used in a very uh, beneficial way. Thank you. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to an excellent panel. You did very well. 
Now, in 1999, I was exposed to restorative justice, and, um, and again in 2001, and then when I came to the IRP last year, I became infected. <laughs> and um, now I would like to spread this. I don't want to call it a disease, but I would like to spread it. So I must tell you, I became very frightened and discouraged when I heard you, Vidya, speak that you 12 years to implement? I don't have, I am an impatient person. <laughs> and this will not and must not happen in 12 years. Now, I would like to know from you, two of you, Vidya and Lisa, do you have background enabling legislation or background legislation which, um, you know, allows you to have restorative justice implemented in your sphere of work. And um, Fernanda, my friend, we were together for the last two days. And um, I'm proud of you. I feel that you're one of us. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Ever since the Crime and Disorder Act was passed in 1998, there have been criticisms that it isn't really restorative justice. And in fact, when I speak of it, I say that the UK or Britain, they in fact um, caught the tune, but they didn't get the words. And to explain, there's a little, when in the, the old days, inspectors used to come to the schools to find out how children were doing in terms of their learning. And um, one of the inspector was, tree, uh, was testing in tables, you know, the three time tables, three ones are three, three. And he called the little boy up. And the boy came up to the front of the class and he said, da, 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 da. and the inspector said, what are you doing, son? He said, sir, I know the tune, but I don't know the words. So to answer your question about legislation in Vermont, we do have legislation in place that allows restorative options at many different points in the criminal justice systems. I don't know that. Does anybody, Sue or Bob or Carol, do you know the name of that legislation that, or the statute that we have? No. Yeah. We, great. <laughs> So I work with Lisa in Vermont. Um, she works in South Burlington. I'm in the Northeast Kingdom. And our center does um, not just the municipality, but all of the county and the Northeast Kingdom, which is what we call uh, the upper quadrant of Vermont. Uh, our legislation um, is the, it's called restorative justice legislation. But the, the legislation really did unleash a lot of processes, not only with the state's attorney's office, but with all of the probation and parole offices and with our local law enforcement. So that, and I think this is sort of key in what was, what's happening in Vermont that, that is really key, really, really important. And that's that we started with something that worked really, really well. Um, back in St. Johnsbury in November of 1995, we had the first restorative justice panel and it was so successful that today we have 90 volunteers that come in and we have two full-time people in our center. It's just good produces more good. And because we have the legislation in place, um, we're allowing people to um, promote it even more. So I was called to the state's attorney's office and they said, we've got this you know, great program, we want to work with you. And I work with a police chief every, you know, every week we go and we sit down. There's one uh, director of restorative justice that actually does rides with the police officers to build that relationship. So we have this working relationship with the police department. Um, I do his little parking thing on the side with a restorative panel to make him really happy. But they send all kinds of things our way, you know, the police, um, will say, you know, I've got this case, I don't think it really, I don't want to do anything with it, except maybe they need some mediation, they'll come to us. You know, I've got these kids that are having a problem, I'm not really sure, they don't really shouldn't be arrested, they come to us. So because we're doing things really, really well, um, our volunteers are just knocking on our doors saying, can I be part of that? So it's, it's good produces more and more good. Great. 
So at the risk of being rude, I just, we're, we're going to ask for quick responses, but we pride ourselves in being on time because the people who are doing the next session want to have their full time, so, and people need transition time. So if you could quickly respond. I would like to respond and thank you for raising this question because it relates to <laughs> yeah, 12 years of implementation. That's right. But it's a journey. Uh, it starts with, uh, it started with a bottom up uh, solution or, or solutions and experiments because we didn't have legislation. So to be able to have a legislation, we had to prove what works. And this is, uh, what takes time. When I went back from, I came back from, to Hungary from US, uh, I was telling to Ted that in, within one year we are going to change the world. <laughs> so it was so naive. It takes, I think, 100 more years <laughs> to really <laughs> change the world. But as my friend from Sweden used to say, uh, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> exactly. So we have to work hard to change the legislation. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful conference. <laughs>